Don't panic.
Good afternoon and welcome to Trinity University's Expert Series webinar. I'm Carla Sierra, Manager of Public Relations, and would like to introduce you to our Trinity expert, Dr. Amer Kaisi. Dr. Kaisi is an award-winning professor of healthcare administration at Trinity University, a top 15 program. He is the author of the book, Intangibles, The Unexpected Traits of High-Performing Healthcare Leaders, which has won the 2019 American College of Healthcare Executives Book of the Year Award. Dr. Kaisi joined the faculty of Trinity University in 2003 after earning a PhD in Health Services Administration from the University of Minnesota. At Trinity, Dr. Kaisi teaches courses in leadership, professional development, and public speaking, and is the director of the executive program. His research interests include leadership and strategy. Dr. Kaisi is a national speaker with a student group and a faculty member of the American College of Healthcare Executives. He is also a certified executive and physician coach. He works with Medi A, Division of Navis, I hope I'm saying that right, and as an executive coach, and he consults with hospitals and healthcare organizations in their strategic planning efforts. Dr. Kaisi is also an avid soccer fan. He lives in San Antonio with his wife and two teenage children. Welcome, Dr. Kaisi. Thank you, Carlo. And thanks for everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for all who have joined us. Thanks to Josh for arranging all of this and making everything look nice. Um, pleasure to be with everyone today to talk about a topic that is especially important during our times during this COVID pandemic, you know, these turbulent times that we're living in, which is how can we gain agility and resilience? Now, what can you expect for the next 45 minutes in this webinar? What I would like to share with you and what I would like to bring to the table is the latest research evidence. What does the science tell us about how we can get a little bit more agile, a little bit more resilient? In addition to that, I'd like to share some stories and some examples, kind of balance things out. Some people have a stronger left brain, some people have a stronger right brain. So we try to have a little bit of everything for everyone in terms of combining the research with the stories. You'll also see that I have some book recommendations and I have some sports examples, but the most important thing is we're gonna end up with some specific take-home behaviors that everyone can take back with them and that they can start doing things a little bit differently with the goal of increasing their agility and their resilience. So I said, um, you know, I'm a sports fan. I love soccer, I love all kinds of sports. And I'll, I'm also a Spurs fan. So I want to start our um, discussion today with a story that may be familiar with a lot of people who have joined us, especially if you live in San Antonio. Um, so this story is about the Spurs. In 2013, the San Antonio Spurs reached the NBA Finals. And in that final, they were playing the Miami Heat. Now, after five games, the Spurs were up 3-2 which meant that in this sixth game, they could clinch the title. They could win the championship. So the game was taking place in Miami. And naturally, the Spurs reserved a restaurant so they can celebrate in case of a win. Um, so they, they reserved a restaurant and they said to themselves, you know, if we win the title, we're going to go celebrate afterwards. So this was game six. Spurs are up by nine points with a few minutes left. Everything is looking great. They can feel it. They can almost touched that trophy, and then the unthinkable happened. The Spurs collapsed. Um, the Miami Heat came back. Ray Allen sank a, a three-pointer at the buzzer, and the game went to overtime. And in overtime, the Miami Heat won. Now, naturally, the Spurs players were dejected. To lose in that way after being so close to winning the championship was a huge setback for the team and for the players. Now, Naturally, many of the players thought that the celebration dinner was going to be canceled afterwards. But Coach Greg Popovich had different ideas. He actually said, no, no, we're still going to go to the dinner. And he drove by himself to the restaurant before the players so that he can make sure that everything was well set up for, for the team. Now, when the team boss arrived, he was waiting there for them. And he greeted every player one by one as they came down from the bus and entered the restaurant. Inside the restaurant, Coach Pop took a few minutes to talk about the loss and to assign accountability to the players for this um, difficult loss. 
But then the amazing thing that happened is that for the rest of the evening, he didn't even talk about basketball anymore. What he did was he went and he talked to every single player. He greeted them one by one. He put an arm around them and he talked to them about what food to order, what drinks to order, pretty much talked about everything except basketball. He showed the players great compassion and that was a huge team building session for the Spurs. Fast forward one year later in 2014, the Spurs met with the Miami Heat again in the final and the outcome this time around was very different. The Spurs won the championship, their fifth championship in 15 years. Now, when the Spurs players were asked, what were some of the factors that contributed to this success in the following year? Many of them traced it back to that dinner that was supposed to be a celebration dinner, but actually ended up being a huge team building dinner. They said that the resilience that they gained on that day was the determining factor that allowed them to come back. And the compassion that Coach Pop showed to them on that day was the main reason why they decided that we're going to come back and we're going to win this championship the following year as they did. So when we talk about resilience, what we're really talking about is how to deal with setbacks, similar to the setback that the Spurs um, you know, experienced in 2013, but also how to handle stress. Now, if we get out of the world of sports and think about what we are facing daily as, you know, students, as faculty members, as executives, as stay-at-home parents, as employees. What we are doing is we're dealing with setbacks and we're trying to handle stress. And there's all kinds of setbacks. People have lost their jobs. People are getting laid off. Some businesses are closing. And even if you still have your job, you're probably dealing with stressors every day. Parents that are trying to work from home while taking care of children. People that are on the front line that have to spend the whole day with their masks on and with their, with their suits on, with their hazmat suits on, right? We, we have a lot of graduates of, of the healthcare administration program that are facing these as frontline employees or as, as uh, leaders of frontline employees. So setbacks and stressors are part of everyday life. And that's why it's especially important for us to talk about resilience today. Now, my agenda for the next 45 minutes is to talk about dealing with setbacks and handling stress, but also talk about the importance of recharging. And then we're going to wrap up with specific take-home behaviors, as I promised earlier. Let us tackle this issue of dealing with setbacks. And let us ask first a question, which is what types of people tend to be more resilient, right? That's an important question for us to uncover together. To answer that, I want to share with you some very important research that one was done back in the mid-70s. So in 1975, researchers brought a group of participants and took them inside a lab, and then they divided them into two groups. The first group went inside a room and was subject to a very loud sound. There was a red button in front of them, and if they pushed that red button, the loud sound stopped. The second group of participants were taken to a similar room where they were subject to a very similar sound. However, the difference in the second room was that if you push the red button, nothing happened. The loud sound continued. So that was on the first day. Now on the second day, they brought the same group of participants to a different room, but with similar circumstances. So people heard the loud sound and had the choice of pushing the red button to see if it stops. The interesting thing was that people who were in the first room on the first day did not hesitate to push the red button because they knew it's going to work and it's going to stop the loud sound. However, people who were in the second room, about two-thirds of them did not even bother to push the red button because they gave up. You know, on the first day, they pushed it over and over and nothing happened. So on the second day, they just assume that it's not going to work. We call that learned helplessness. Now, notice that I said two-thirds of the people who were in the second room and not all of them, because actually one third of them, despite the setback of the previous day, despite the fact that on the previous day, they kept on pushing and pushing and nothing happened, they still tried to push the red button on the second day. Who are these people that are resilient like that? Well, these people tend to be optimistic. And we know based on research that resilient people are optimistic. They interpret setbacks as temporary. It's going away quickly. 
they say to themselves, this, this challenge, this, this difficulty is going to go away quickly. They also interpret setbacks as just local. You know, it's just one, this one situation. It's not the whole world is falling apart, but it's just one difficult situation. And they also tell themselves, I can do something about it. You know, maybe I can't um, change it, but at least I can change my attitude about it. I can change the way I deal with it. I was actually just having a conversation with my kids. I have two teenagers who received news, um, like many others earlier this week, that schools, uh, private and public schools in San Antonio are going to be online at least to Labor Day. And they were both very upset with that. They wanted to go back to school. They wanted to see their, their friends. And the conversation that we had was that this is temporary. Yes, it may sound like this COVID pandemic has been going on forever, but actually it's only been going on for a few months and it's going to go away. At some point in time, we're going to go back to something that was that is a little bit similar to how we were doing things before. So we're saying resilient people are optimistic, but it's not a kind of naive optimism. What we're talking about is optimism that is balanced with reality. It's realistic optimism. And this realistic optimism was actually coined by Jim Collins in his classical management book, Good to Great. He talked about something called the Stockdale Paradox. And the Stockdale Paradox is based on the story of Admiral John, uh, John Stockdale, who served in the Vietnam War. So Admiral Stockdale was actually taken as a prisoner of war and was a prisoner for about eight years. During those eight years, he was subject to numerous um, torture sessions. However, he survived being captive for eight years, and he came back um, after the war. Now, when he came back, experts asked him, how were you able to deal with that situation, being a prisoner for eight years, um, being subject to torture? And he said that he dealt with it with this optimist or realistic optimism. He said that he constantly told himself that, yes, this is a tough situation. I'm in deep trouble here. I am a prisoner um, in Vietnam. But he was always optimistic that he's going to prevail. I believe that we can all learn lessons from the Stockdale Paradox and from this realistic optimism. We can all tell ourselves, yes, this COVID pandemic and the whole situation around us is very tough. However, we all should have the belief that we're going to prevail at the end and that we're going to go back to our normal lives or whatever normal will look like. Now, we all know that optimists tend to see the glass half full, right? Pessimists, on the other hand, see the glass half empty. Now, what we're talking about here is realists. These are the people who see the glass exactly as it is, okay? So that's, that's what I'm talking about here is realistic optimism, all right? I'm gonna pause here for laughter and then move on. Um, in their great book, Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant, their great book, Option B, talk about this quality of resilience, not as a fixed trait, not as something that either you're born with it or you're not, but rather it's a muscle that we can all work on and that we can all build and develop. So how do we go about developing resilience and building muscle for, for resilience? Let's look at what the research says, right? I promised earlier that we're going to talk mostly about evidence and science and research. One of the main setbacks that anyone can face throughout the course of their career is getting fired. So this is a study among executives who got fired, but also who got laid off. And unfortunately, this is a common situation uh, taking place now more so than, than usual. Um, you know, we have a lot of graduates in the healthcare administration program that recently called us and said, Yes, I lost my job. I was laid off because of everything that's happening in, in the world and specifically in healthcare. Now, what do we know about the people who get laid off or who get fired, but rather than allowing that to affect their career in a negative way, actually their career soars after that setback or that negative event. So the research showed that people whose career soared after getting fired or getting laid off were the type of people who looked facts in the face without any shame, without any guilt, but also were resilient enough to lean on their professional network and relied on their experience to get their next job. So we know that resilient people own their, their circumstances, no matter how tough these circumstances are, and do it without any shame and without any guilt. 
What do we know about optimists and what are the benefits of being an optimist? Again, a realistic optimist. This is a study done among professionals at hundreds of companies across industry. And they followed people longitudinally and compared people who are optimists, realistic optimists with people who are not. And what they found is that the optimists over time are more likely to get a promotion the following year. They're six times more likely to be highly engaged in their work and they're much less likely to burn out or to feel disengaged and exhausted at work. So optimists do better over the course of their career. This resilience that they have is not only good for them psychologically, but also allows them to make more money and they're more likely to be promoted over the course of their careers. Now, we've talked about resilience in terms of handling uh, and, and dealing with setbacks. Now we switch gears to talk a little bit about handling stress. Hans Selye is a um, Hungarian endocrinologist that actually coined the term stress. He's the one who came up with the term stress. What he says is that it's not stress that kills us, it's our reaction to it. It's about changing our mindset in dealing with stress. And part of changing our mindset is to remind ourselves that resilience is not about enduring, but rather is about recharging. So many of us think that if I just put my head down and keep on doing what I'm doing, then this is how I demonstrate resilience. And nothing could be further from the truth. This is not resilience. This is driving yourself towards burnout and exhaustion. If you really want to be resilient, you have to take time to, you have to take time to recharge. So what do you know about people who don't do that, right? What do you want about people who don't recharge and how do they handle stress or, or uh, fail to handle stress? This is a very interesting study. Um, Alexandra Mitchell went and um, studied young investment bankers that worked about 15 hours per day for several years. It's, it's a well-known fact that investment bankers, when they start their careers, they're subject to extreme working conditions. So they work 15 hours per day with only with hardly a day off and no vacations for several years. So she went and she embedded them herself with them to try to see what kind of impact does that have on the individual when they have so much stress and they are not recharging, but rather they're just enduring and enduring. And here's what, what she found. She found that first it starts with a physical impact, dramatic weight change, hair loss, and panic attacks, only from having to work very hard. And then this even progresses to diabetes, heart problem, and some people even have cancer. And all of these are observed at higher rates than the rates they're observed in the general population. Not only that, but people who work under these extreme conditions actually have severe mental consequences, such as addiction to drugs and alcohol and pornography, loss of empathy towards other people, and not surprisingly, a lot of depression and anxiety. When she interviewed, when the researcher interviewed people, those young investment bankers who were going through these uh, 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 grueling schedules, here's what one of them said. They said, when you lose the feeling of your body and compassion and respect for yourself, when you don't have compassion for yourself, you do the same to others. Bankers who have been riding themselves become people eaters. When you don't practice self-compassion, there's no way you're going to practice compassion towards others. Here's another study where they um, look at people and look at their habits of how they take their daily breaks or how they fail to take their daily breaks. It's a common thing, especially in, in um, corporate America, for some people to skip lunch, right? It's, it's a common thing. I skipped lunch today. I didn't have lunch, time for lunch today because I was too busy. What is the impact of actually skipping lunch? What they found is that people who skipped lunch on a daily basis, that resulted in a physical and mental exhaustion for them that even uh, affected them during the weekend. So in the weekend, they also felt exhausted and they had unusual um, uh, or, or um, unhealthy sleep pattern. So we know for sure that enduring doesn't work. What works is recharging and recovering. And this is what we're going to talk about next, is what are different ways we can recharge and recover? We're going to talk about some very basic stuff, such as rest, mindfulness, setting boundaries, and sleep. Let us start with rest. It's a great book written by Brad Stuberg and Steve Magnus, in which they studied the performance of top athletes. We're talking Olympic champions. We're talking 
um, triathlon champions. And what they realized was that those athletes that grew over time, that improved their performance over time, you could pin it down to a very simple equation. And that simple equation is stress plus rest equals growth. So Olympic medal winners and extreme sports champions realize that they're going to have a lot of stress. However, they build in stress as part of their training program. They think of rest not as a luxury, not as a, an extra that is outside of the training, but rather as part of the training. And this is the only way they can grow and they can achieve what they achieve. How many of us think of rest as part of our work, right? As part of our project or our plan or our professional development plan. Very few of us think of it, but if we really want to be resilient, we need to build in rest into our days. And this is especially important during our current days when many of us either are working long, long hours, let's say as healthcare professionals or that people um, you know, in other industries or working also from home. So rest is really straightforward. It's about taking short breaks, scheduling them, right? Planning fun time on the weekend, even though we're social distancing, even though we are not getting together with other people, it's still being intentional about planning that fun time. Taking your days off. I hear from a lot of executives these days that say, what's the point of taking my days off? It's not like I'm going to go on vacation to the beach or go to the mountains or something. So why, why should I take my day off? You still need to take your days off because you need to practice self-compassion and self-care. And finally, my suggestion, read a book. Absolutely important, all right? Yes, you need to know about what's happening in the world. You need to follow the news. You need to um, be on social media every now and then. But don't make that all what you do outside of work. A few months ago, in the midst of, of the pandemic, I wrote an article on, on LinkedIn in which I advised people to skip Facebook and the news and just to read a book. You know, don't waste your brain and your time on social media and on 24-hour cable news. So often, if that's how you're spending your, your free hours, you are not recharging. In fact, you are feeling more exhausted. Instead, develop a book reading list. Find a couch and start reading. And if you want any suggestions on what books to read, please reach out to me. I have a great list of leadership books, business books, but also some leisure books and some, some novels that I can um, share with you all. And there are obviously so, so many other resources on that. The second thing that I want to talk about other than rest is mindfulness. Now, mindfulness does not necessarily mean, you know, meditating for hours at end or having to go and sit in, in, in a cave, although that could be very helpful for some people. Mindfulness, as we're thinking about it, is really just taking the time to think, to reflect, possibly to journal, to seek solitude, and to meditate if that works for you. So let's talk about these things. You know, Jim Mattis, who is the former Secretary of Defense and who is a four-star general, um, recently said that he believes that the single biggest problem for leaders in our current age is lack of reflection. And he advises everyone to seek solitude, to reflect while others are reacting, because that will allow us to improve our decision-making and improve our resilience. Now, Think about it. Why do most of us don't stop to reflect? Why do we not like to build time to reflect and to think and to meditate and to journal? Well, the answers may come to us from a study of goalkeepers, soccer goalkeepers. So as, as we mentioned earlier, I'm a huge soccer fan. And, and this study was really interesting because they studied a large number of penalty kicks that take place in top leagues and, and championships worldwide. Now, a penalty kick, for those who don't know soccer that well, is that stage of the game when there is one player who shoots the ball from a dead ball situation and the goalie is there to save it. Now, if you really think about it, soccer goalies, when they're defending a penalty kick, if they stay in the center of the goal instead of going left or going right, they have a 33% chance of stopping that kick. However, the research shows that practically, what goalies do is they stay in the center of the goal only 6% of the time. Now, why is that the case? I mean, that, that's so interesting. If, if you just thought about the statistics, you will stay in the middle of the goal and you have, you have a better chance of saving the ball. Well, goalies just feel better when they do something. 
We feel like there's an expectation to do something, and the same is true of many people. Reflection can feel like staying in the center of the goal and missing the action. And so many of us don't want to miss the action. We don't want to stay in the middle of the goal. We're going to lunge right or left. We're going to try to do something. But that is not always the right thing to do. Peter Drucker, the father of management, said some very wise words. He said, follow effective action with quiet reflection. And then from that quiet reflection will come even more effective action. A few years ago, there was a great article in Harvard Business Review that talked about why everyone should make time for self-reflection, even if you hate doing it. Now, the article was directed towards executives, but I believe it applies to all different kinds of people in all um, walks of life. Here's what the main take-home point from it is. You are not going to stop to reflect or journal or think unless if you put it on the schedule. If you just leave it up to chance, it's not going to happen. So schedule your reflection, your reflection time and then commit to keep it. But if you find yourself trying to skip it or trying to avoid it, then you need to reflect on that and you need to know why that is happening. Another aspect of recharging is journaling, okay? It's taking the time early in the morning or late in the evening or any other time that works for you to write down your thoughts. I really love this quote from journalist Julia Cameron who said, Journaling is like having windshield wipers that swipe away at anything that stands between you and a clear view of your day, whether that's a view of your day before it starts or the view of your day after it has ended. It's a beautiful, beautiful words about the importance of journaling and how they can help us shift our mindset and have a clear view of the challenges that we face every day. Now, you notice that in all of these things, rest, meditation, um, reflection, there is an element of solitude. Michael Harris wrote a great book about the importance of solitude, but there was a very clear message there that solitude is not about being antisocial. Okay, so many people, when I talk to them about solitude, except, especially executives and leaders, they're, they're um, a little bit scared by the idea of solitude because they don't like being by themselves. So what we're not advocating for antisocial behavior, but rather we're, we're asking for people to find solitude because that can help them strengthen their memory, sharpen their awareness, and it will spur their creativity, can make them calmer, more attentive, clearer headed. These days, seeking solitude is actually much easier, especially that many of us um, have uh, more flexible schedules as we're working from home. Maybe it's a walk in the park in the morning or late in the evening. Maybe it's sitting out in the backyard or at the porch and just thinking and reflecting. Now, note that this is not about going into solitude so we can stay in solitude, but rather this is about being in solitude so that we are better company when we rejoin the crowd. So this is about preparing us to be even better when we are social. I also wrote another article at the beginning of, of the COVID pandemic where I um, advocated for a practice called self-distancing. You know, in the age of social distancing, we're all talking about social distancing and six feet away. Self-distancing can actually be very, very valuable. Self-distancing is about creating space between yourself and your feelings. And extreme sport athletes practice that when they find themselves in the middle of a very tough challenge. What they do is they pretend that they are thinking about giving advice to a friend rather than thinking about themselves. That separation between yourself and the situation allows you to think more clearly about it. So rather than thinking, oh, I'm in the middle of this you know, COVID pandemic and I, you know, have to deal with all of these challenges and all of these difficulties, try to think about if this, if I was giving advice to a friend or if I was thinking about this for someone else, what would I tell them and how would I behave? And finally, we get to meditation. Now, meditation is one of those things that not a lot of people like to do or not a lot of people enjoy doing and so many people don't even know how to do. So people will tell me, you know, I don't have time. I don't like it. You know, where am I going to find 20 minutes every day to meditate? So instead of doing it the regular traditional way, here's one suggestion that I have here. Here's a very nice practice. It's called the three by two morning prioritization. So what do most of us do when we wake up in the morning, especially those of us who are in the workplace? You know, when we go to work or even when you go down to your home office or your, you know, you open your laptop on your bed these days, 
what is the first thing that we do? We open our email inboxes and we start answering email. Here's an alternative to that. Instead of that, try first to sit for two minutes and do nothing. Just two minutes, that's it. Let your mind settle into focus, calm, and clarity. The next two minutes, think to yourself, what are the most important priorities for me today, both professional and personal priorities? And then plot those priority activities into your calendars. Look at what Zoom calls you have to do. Look at what things you have to take care of with your family and make sure that all of these priorities are reflected into your calendar. That's it. Six minutes every morning. You know, it's a form of meditation, but really it's all about being mindful and starting your day with an intentional approach. So we've talked about rest. We've talked about mindfulness. Now let's get to setting boundaries and this issue of sleep, this very important issue of sleep. Setting boundaries is especially important these days when many of us find ourselves working from home. We need to be very intentional about deciding when we are working and when we are not working because otherwise we end up working all the time, right? So one of the habits that I hear from people uh, saying to themselves is no work after 6 p.m. That it's nothing, right? Even if you, you don't have any plans after 6 p.m., you're just going to shut down your laptop and go and spend time with your family or go for a walk on the park or call a friend or a family member. No work on Sundays or on, on days that you are taking off, right? Being very, very disciplined about that. Now, so many of us break that rule and work on the weekend, work on evenings, work on Sundays. That doesn't just have a negative impact on us. It has also a negative impact on the people who work with us, especially if we are in a leadership position. So the research shows that the number of emails sent by a manager on a Sunday evening is actually directly related to the number of minutes that their direct reports spend on email that same Sunday evening, right? So if you're sitting there firing emails on Sunday evening, people who work with you and for you think that it's the expectation for them to reply to those emails. So not only are you ruining your own Sunday evening, but you're ruining other people's Sunday evening. Morton Hampton wrote another great book called Great at Work. And in that book, he talks about how top performers actually do less and work better, but then achieve more. And some of the research that he quotes is research that looked at the number of hours that people work per week. So many people think that the more you work, then the better you perform, right? That, that's a common adage, especially in, in um, corporate America. Well, the research shows that, yes, if you work, if you work more, up to a certain point, you're going to achieve more. But then that that um, curve starts to flatten a little bit. Actually, it goes down after a certain number of hours per week. So really, if you think about it, the, the, um, the, the, the marginal return of working more hours is not worth it over a certain amount of hours. So keep that in mind by setting boundaries on evenings and also on weekends and days off. Here's a question for you all. If you were to guess what would you say is the single best performance enhancing intervention for humans? It's not drugs, it's not alcohol. It actually is sleep. In his great book, Eat, Sleep, Work and Repeat, this, this book came out earlier this year, Bruce Daisley talks about the importance of sleep and how we should all be very, very protective of our sleep hours. Research shows that sleep is very important for all kinds of employees, for all kinds of human beings, but especially for leaders. I mean, it's no surprise for you to know that leaders or team managers who show up sleep deprived, they're impatient, they're irritable, they're antagonistic, and it's no surprise that lack of sleep leads to strained relationships at work. So no one, no one is a sur surprised by that. And yet we all continue to um, not protect our sleep or to treat it like a luxury rather than the necessity that it is. One of my favorite quotes of all time is a quote by a um, Austrian psychologist called Viktor Frankl. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. And he said that between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So taking the wisdom from that quote, if you really think about it, resilience is all about how do we treat, deal with those stimuli 
those setbacks, those stressors that are affecting us on a daily basis, especially during these difficult times. It's all about how, what will our response be? What kind of space can we build in there? What kind of reflection? What kind of rest? What kind of mindfulness practice can we build so that we have more time to react to these responses, to better deal with setbacks, and to show resilience in handling stress? So we've talked about setbacks and stress and the importance of recharging. Now let's, let's focus on some specific take-home behaviors that we can all start doing differently that will help us improve our resilience. The take-home behaviors that I want to focus on for the next 10 minutes are practicing humility, practicing compassion, practicing generosity, and also practicing gratitude. Let us start with this concept of humility. As we find ourselves in the midst of a difficult time, it's important to remind ourselves of what we can control, but also what we can't control. A lot of what's happening around us are things that we can't control. Yes, we can control whether we wear a mask or not, or whether we social distance, or whether we quarantine at home. But we can't control what other people are doing. We can't control what governments are doing. And that's okay. We, we need to be okay with that. And we need to remember how small and insignificant we are in the larger schemes of history, nature, and universe. Yes, this is a huge problem. This is once-in-a-lifetime event that is taking place in, in our lives. But if you look at history, the whole universe, this is really a small, insignificant event. One of my favorite YouTube videos, and it's something that I recommend that you take a look at, is a video called How the Universe is Way Bigger Than You Think. Watch those 10 minutes. It just shows you how small we are not only in comparison or relatively to the earth itself, but just relative to the whole universe and, and you know, all of the things that are going on in that universe and how we're just a small little dot. And that helps you get some perspective and get some more humility. Now, humility is not only important in terms of how we think about the world, but also in terms of how we deal others that are with us, especially those of us who are in charge of dealing with the crisis. So they did a study among medical task force teams after another major crisis, which you know happened about 12 years ago in China, with the major earthquake. So they looked at the leaders of those teams and they saw which leaders demonstrated humility and which did not. What they found was when teams had humble leaders, their team members were more, more creative, their team members were able to look at the perspective of others and take a comprehensive evaluation of the situation. So leader humility is crucial for teams while they are dealing with crisis. So this is a special message for those of you who are out there managing teams and having to deal with different aspects of the current crisis. Practicing humility can help your team members deal better with, with the crisis. Another aspect of that is practicing empathy and compassion. Now, what does empathy and compassion mean? We can think about it as operating at three different levels. At the cognitive level, it tells the other person, I understand you. At the emotional level, it tells the other person, I feel for you. And at the behavioral level, it tells the other person, I want to help you. So the first two levels are what we call empathy. And the last one, the behavioral part is compassion. Now, if you find yourself being having the good fortune of being able to understand, feel, and help others. You need to engage in those acts of compassion. You need to demonstrate that empathy. Let me share with you an example of how a, an executive, a healthcare executive that I coach is demonstrating empathy during the current COVID crisis. So a, a young healthcare leader called Gabby, we're gonna call her Gabby, um, we, we've been working together for a while and we looked at her emotional intelligence scores and it showed that she has high stress tolerance but low empathy, okay? So we've been working a while on, on this. And then when the COVID crisis hit, she was put in charge of redeploying many of the nurses in her facility to go from the medical surgical units to the ICU because this is where the need is. So Gabby is in charge of redeployed staff and we worked on how can she show empathy towards those redeployed staff. 
We talked about that not everyone is going to have the same stress tolerance that she has, and that's why she had to work on her empathy. She did that by focusing on two very effective practices, active listening without interrupting and with curiosity and compassion, and connecting to other people at the personal level. Again, if you are a team leader who is dealing with any way or in any way dealing with the current crisis, empathy, listening, and connecting on a personal level can go a long way. We talked earlier about the importance of taking care of ourselves, right? That's self-compassion, but that's not enough. We also need to show compassion towards others. Now, if you don't know where to start, if you don't know what to do, I have a great book recommendation for you. It's called Humankind. It came out late last year by Brad Aronson. He talks about the importance of small acts of compassion and kindness and how these can change the world. I just finished reading the book. I, it's, it's one of the best books I've read in a long time, especially it's a feel-good book in these days. And not only that, it's a practical book that tells you if you want to help, what kind of help you can provide to others. We talked about humility and compassion. Now let's move to generosity and gratitude. Now, practicing generosity is not just about giving, giving money, although if, if you have the ability to, to do that, I think that's a great thing to do in the current crisis. It's about giving from your time, from your energy, and your, your talent. A few years ago, Adam Grant, the Wharton professor, wrote a very good book called Give and Take, in which he talks about three different types of people in the world. He talks about givers, takers, and matchers. So givers are those who enter every relationship with the intent of helping the other person. Takers are those who go into every relationship with the intent of just taking. And then matchers are the kind of people who are very calculating. I will only help you if you help me back. And the question that the book asks is what kind of people are more effective at work and in life? So Grant summarizes the research on that. So there was research done, for example, among professional engineers. And they asked people to rate each other, whether they were giver, matcher, or, or, um, or taker. And then they looked at the performance. And what they found was that the highest performers were givers, but also the lower performers were givers. And then matchers and takers were in the middle. They did the same study among medical school students. They looked at their grades, but also they looked at which students helped each other and which students did not. And here again, they found that the lowest achievers were givers, but also the highest achievers were givers. And the takers and the matchers were middle performers. So if we were to summarize that research, we would see, you know, it looks like a, a uh, perfectly um, well-distributed curve. The takers and the matchers on the middle, the givers are high performers, but also the givers are low performers. So how do we explain that? Well, it turns out that the low performing givers are the pushovers. So these are the people who help others without helping themselves. But the high performing givers are the successful ones who protect their time, who take care of themselves, who give themselves enough rest and recovery, but also who are available to helping others. Now, you may be asking yourself, you know, in, in these difficult times, do I even have the energy to help someone else, especially at work? You know, do I want to mentor a, a young colleague? Do I want to mentor a, a high school student or a college student? You know, I don't have the time for this. I have so much dealing with. It turns out that helping others at work could help us. So people who serve as mentor, they say that they experience lower levels of anxiety and describe their job as more meaningful. They find that their interactions with their junior colleague, colleagues are therapeutic. We all need less stress. We all need a little bit more engagement and more meaningfulness in, in our lives right now. So mentoring someone or helping someone goes a long way. The last point that I wanna make is about practicing gratitude. First, practice gratitude personally, internally, by reflecting on what you're grateful for on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. Some people like having a gratitude journal. So what if it sounds touchy-feely? It's a great practice. I do it every now and then whenever I remember, and, and it's really good practice, especially during these difficult days. But not only that, practice gratitude towards others. And in my experience, the single best way of doing that is to write a handwritten thank you note. Not an email, not a text, but a good old fashioned handwritten thank you notes to others. You know, a thank you note that you address to someone else's, you know, home address and they open it with their family members and they, you can see the impact that it has on them. It has to be honest, has to be sincere, 
And it has to be specific to a certain behavior that they've done towards you. Let me share with you one last story before we wrap up. Campbell's Soup was struggling financially and both in terms of its employee engagement. And then a CEO called Doug Conant was brought in. Within 10 years, he turned the company around. Employee engagement and morale went up the roof. And um, their financial performance improved. Campbell's Soup became one of the best performance companies in the country. When Doug Conant left Campbell's Soup after this successful turnaround, he was asked what was the secret for his success? And he said, handwritten thank you notes. He said that he had written 30,000 thank you notes in 10 years. Let us all make that a practice to write thank you notes to others, whether at work or in our personal relationships. The evidence here again shows that the impact of writing a thank you note, of showing gratitude, of giving to others is not only positive for the receiver, but it's also positive for the givers. The results showed that people who make writing those letters of gratitude, those thank you notes, a practice, actually they're happier, they're more satisfied with life, and they tend to have less depressive symptoms. I want to end with a great quote from the great philosopher, Kelly Clarkson, who said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Actually, it may have been Nietzsche who said that before, before her, and we were, we're not sure, but the, the message is true. Really, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We all, need to be, we all need to be agile. We all need to be resilient during these difficult times. So let me end here with sharing my contact information. I can be reached on my Trinity email address. I'm also available on LinkedIn. And the book that, that I wrote is Intangible. So if you liked what you heard today, um, a lot of it is in the book, so please check out the book. Also, I have a new newsletter, a leadership newsletter, I, in which I share every month what leadership book I'm reading. So if you're interested in that, please check out my website and, and sign up for the newsletter. But it's been a pleasure to be with you here today, and we are going to stop now and see if we have um, any questions to answer. Okay, yes, we do have some questions, Dr. Kaisi. One of those questions is, how do you suggest implementing these behaviors when at home with family? Yeah, I think that is, that is a challenge that all of us are facing these days. And I think setting a schedule that is as close as possible to normal schedule goes a long way. Um, I know people have little children and people have teenagers, I have teenagers at home, and everyone's mm -hmm. trying to work from home and everyone trying to zoom in to their calls. So I think creating some time that, you know, you're, you're, um, you can't be reached by your family members is important for everyone to say, you know, from this, this hour to this hour, I'm actually going to work, even though going to work means just a few steps to the extra bedroom or to the basement or to the office, just creating that kind of separation in terms of, um, you know, allowing yourself that time to be focused and to be away, but then also setting the boundaries and not allowing work to spill over well, um, family time and, and personal time, because that's what some of us do sometimes. You know, there are, there are two extremes. There are some people who can't get any work done during these difficult times, and there are some people who find themselves actually working more than they used to work before. So I believe it's, it's a, a big part of it is about setting boundaries. And I realize that, that this is much easier said than done. Okay, another question. With this pandemic creating new levels of stress and chaos in many of our lives, particularly those in healthcare and in education environments, how do you recommend we further discern between enduring stress and being resilient? Seems everything is heightened with the current state of the world. I think my advice here is turn off the news. Um, turn off social media. Um, seriously. Yes, you need to be aware of what's happening. I have an app on my phone that tells me every day how many new cases are in Bayer County. I, I need to know that. That's important to know. I need to know whether there is a shelter at home directive or something like that. But the rest of the news, you really don't need to know it. And even if you need to know it, you don't need to know it on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. You don't need to get it live. You can have a website that summarizes the news to you or an app that summarizes the news to you and gives them to you 
at the end of every day or even every other day or every week. Um, social media, I mean, talk of something that can heighten and sensationalize small insignificant events. I would say turn that off. And again, my suggestion is just read a book. All right, start a project, do whatever, you know, make sure that this time in your life counts. Plant the seeds for something big in your life. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that, that um, I am taking advantage of now, or at least trying to, um, despite the challenges, is possibly to write another book. I'm trying to see this opportunity as, as you know, a blessing in disguise, this difficulty as, as an opportunity or a blessing in disguise and say, maybe this is a time for me to think about another book and write another, another book. I'm sure other people have other projects that maybe if this didn't happen, they wouldn't have had the time to do it. So instead of wasting our, our times and our brains on the news and the 24 hour cable networks and social media, I think we can, we can be intentional about focusing our attention on things that are a little bit more meaningful. Good point. Okay. Um, how do we tactfully let our bosses or coworkers know that we won't be working on weekends unless under a specific deadline or that we're on vacation? I think that is really hard if, if the company culture and if, if the boss does not buy in into, into that separation and those boundaries. If, if your boss sends emails on evenings and weekends and expects a reply, it's really hard to not to reply. You, you, you find yourself in a tough situation. However, my message is for people who are bosses and who are managers and team leaders. Um, don't do that to your team members. Set the expectation. Separate, um, you know, separate work from, from, from life and allow people to separate work from life. Now, you may find yourself as, you know, as, as a team leader that maybe your only time to send emails is on a Sunday morning. That's, you know, for you, that's a good time. It, it doesn't interfere with anything else. Fine, send those emails. But, but there is an option in your um, Gmail account that allows you to delay sending those messages, right? You can write them all on Sunday morning, but they don't get to people's inboxes till Monday at 7 a.m. So be compassionate and empathetic towards the people who work for you. Now, for the people who find themselves working in these situations, it, it is a hard situation. If, if Again, if your boss or if your company expects that and they think this is part of, of the way of doing here, I'd say it's, it's time for you to evaluate whether, whether the job is really worth it. You know, if that job is taking a toll on your mental health and your personal relationships, if, if your boss is sending you, you know, text messages after midnight expecting a reply, um, I, I'd say it's time to evaluate whether that, that um, job is that important. And if it is, you may have to, to endure a little bit. Um, so I'm, I don't have a magical answer here. My answer is very practical in that sometimes you just have to deal with it. But if you are in charge, you have the power to change the culture. You have the power to set the expectations. Okay. Uh, another question. Are you available for presentations outside of Trinity such as with other businesses via Zoom or in person when we're back uh, able to gather again? Oh, I'm happy to talk with any group and to learn with any group. So the, the short answer is yes. So this is my email address here on the screen and people can find me on the Trinity website and I'll be more than happy to talk about, um, you know, other opportunities to engage with audiences. Okay. How should we let our colleagues know that we don't have the bandwidth to help with extra projects without fear of not being a team player? Yeah, I, th I find that this is a common challenge, especially for women in the workplace. Let me, let me put it that way. You know, men are expected to help, but women are expected to help even more. And, you know, if you don't help, then you are labeled as a non-team player or you are labeled as someone who, who um, um, you know, doesn't want to collaborate. Um, again, no easy answer here. Um, if the company culture is like that and it's, it's, if people don't have any empathy towards working parents or people who are busy or people who are taking care of um, elderly parents or, or some other family members, it, it's very hard to change that culture on your own. And again, you have to think to yourself, is, is 
you know, staying within that culture worth it for you, given the toll that it's taken on you. But again, similar message. If you are in charge, you need to change that culture. You need to, to set the expectations and you need to allow people to balance work and life. Now, please don't misunderstand my message of balancing work and life as advocating laziness or, or slacking off at work. Mm -hmm. None of that is, is correct, obviously. You know, obviously to, to perform, you have to, um, you know, to, to reach high levels and to achieve great things, you have to perform, you have to put in the, the hard work and the, and, and the hours. But the evidence actually shows that you can actually do more by working less. I mean, that, that is the amazing evidence that I shared in some of these books and research studies is if we work less hours, of course, within a certain range, we can actually do more and achieve more at work. And, and that's my message for people who are in positions of authority, who are in charge, is to look at that research and to understand that research and then to find ways to design their workplace cultures um, to, to respect rest, to respect recharging, to respect family time while still um, working hard. And one uh, quick question before we close. How can we follow more of the articles that you've written? Um, somebody here says they, they just found you on LinkedIn. Of course, you put that on your screen. So how can they follow more of your articles or read them? I would say LinkedIn is, is the best place right now. So um, I'm, you know, this is, this is the only app I have on my phone. Again, I, I made a decision to um, not to have so many social media apps for, for the reason we talked about, but LinkedIn is one that I feel is, is valuable um, for people like me to interact professionally. So um, people are interested in, in looking at some of the content that I put out there can, can find it through LinkedIn or also through my website, which is also um, on the screen. All right, and um, before we close, we want to let the audience know that they can rewatch this presentation of yours at live.trinity.edu. And that pretty much uh, takes us to the end of our time. Dr. Kaisi, thank you so much for uh, sharing your My pleasure with us today. And we want to thank our audience as well. Thank you for joining us and for all your questions.